Well, today we're going to talk about Q of M, the Richard of St. Victor, and his argument that the Holy Trinity is a necessity if you believe that God is the highest good and not a, rather than a problem. And a large part of that is going to arise from developments in notions of love in the 12th century. And I wanted to talk to, to you about this for two reasons. One, Richard St. Victor really extends a lot of Anselm's arguments in the Lillian Pro Sophion. So we're going to see how these arguments for God as the highest being are going to be applied to the Trinity in more detail for Richard St. Victor. Richard St. Victor will be a very influential figure on um, later 14th century philosophers like Duns Scotus, William of Ockham, all of these people. It's also good because in a course like this where you have a lot of ancient and medieval things, we don't get a chance to deal with the 12th century normally. And this is going to be a good opportunity for you to see what happens between Anselm and Thomas Aquinas and why you might want to take a medieval philosophy class where you can actually get into detail on these things. Because a lot is happening in the 12th century, but if you have a fast class like this, you can do it one day. So last time, we began to think a little bit about how love might be applied to the Trinity. We thought about how you would have it. Even human love requires a certain kind of self-love that enables a person to then love other people. And in the case of God, you might think that he needs to, um, that a, high, a, a good God would need to have love within himself in some way. But, but Richard's really going to take this, the argument of a notch. And, but, so, so, but before we get into to that, what, if you had your hand out, if you could turn to, uh, Turn to the part about the lesson on the Trinity because so it's the very first few lines. And I, I want you guys to think about what the purpose of this lover, beloved, love triad is in these quotes. Because the use of love to describe the Trinity is, is a long, has a long tradition. It's just Richard's doing something slightly new, but you need to think to yourself, what does he do? What was the what what was the original intention of applying this to the Trinity? So Augustine says, but what is love or charity? Charity is considered the highest form of love, the kind of love that you might find in 1 Corinthians, uh, the, the famous passage used when people get married, love is patient, love is kind, love is not in your boast, which divine scripture so greatly proclaims and, and praises, except the love of the good, but love is of someone that loves, a lover, and with, with love, something is loved. Behold, then, there are three things. He that loves, and that which is loved, and love. What, then, is love except a certain life which couples or, ce or cease to couple together some two things? And this is so even in outward and carnal loves. And then a little bit later, he's going to write, The mind cannot love itself unless it also knows itself. Therefore, the mind itself, um, of itself, its love of, of itself and its knowledge of itself are a kind of trinity. These three are one, and when they are perfect, they are equal. What is Augustine doing in these passages? Why does he bring up love in relation to the trinity? How's it, what kind of thing? Is he arguing for something? Is he making an analogy? What's he doing? If you were to summarize, okay, Augustine is doing this in this passage. I know you're kind of in fear of tre trepidation. You know, you're like, I've got, she's got, clearly got an answer. I think you're talking about what's required for and how it has to be from a series of relationships. Mm -hmm. um, because <laughs> okay, so so we're thinking he's in some sense just trying to understand how love works and how that might love might be found in God. 
what are some other things that he's trying to do with this? Is this an argument for God being something? Being like God? Christian God in particular being the one true God? Is this an argument for that? <coughs> Well, we have a model here of lover loved the love, which is itself a model of the Trinity. So I think that's part of what he's doing. Um, but partly, too, we've been talking a lot about ascent of the soul. Mm -hmm. And so there's, if you want to think of it this way, it's as if God is a big magnet that attracts <laughs> the soul and pulls it upward. And so part of what I see happening here is that love is, is dynamic, it's directional. And so this ties in, in a sense, with this idea of God as reaching out and and loving, not just sort of being a metaphysical abstraction, but actually pulling us toward himself. So there's both the internal thing and that external. Yeah, it's a kind of life. I mean, really, it's a kind of, I mean, oftentimes when we think of God as the highest good, it feels very abstract. But when we start thinking of God in terms of love, it puts a kind of movement and a kind of life, I mean, movement in a qualified sense, and a kind of life internal and directed towards creatures. One of the things that, that definitely is happening here too is that we've got an analogy. You know, this happens a lot. St. Patrick had the analogy of the Trinity being like a three-leaf clover, right? Or and you have we have lots of analogies, analogies of the Trinity about light. So the the, the, the purpose of analogies are to say well, you know, we don't have a lot of things that resemble the Trinity, but there are a few things on Earth that have similarity to it, and thus we can grasp it in some qualified way. Love is a good love, love and love is one of those um, ways we can think of three things being one. The, the knower and memory understanding and will is another way for us to understand a natural kind of image of the Trinity in the world. But, but this is, in some sense, it's designed to help you find an analogy. What we're going to find in the true St. Victor is going to be slightly different, is, is that he's going to be arguing that love in itself is one of the highest books. And if you want a God who is the, is the highest good, then he has to have love within himself. And therefore, it's, it's taking Augustine and Anselm slightly one step further, and because he's going to also think, but but like Augustine and Anselm, he's going to think about the nature of love in a very deep way, both human and divine. And, and thank you, Dan, for also mentioning the concept of this hierarchy being drawn up, because the ancient concepts of love often, we talked about this also, are hierarchical. Also, like right? in our yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, and so, but, and or within Plato, you have kind of the good has a beauty that draws love people in in love towards that beauty, a kind of eros or erotic love. But you know, it's, it's a kind of a hierarchical love in Plato. There's there's that which is beloved, which is higher up. And there's that which loves and which is just trying to get there, right? And you and you see this kind of there might be friendship relationships that help you get there, um, but these friendship relationships aren't the highest form of love. That the direction towards the good is is the highest form of love. And even friendship relationships in Plato are a form of hierarchy. This is why Plato emphasizes the role of the teacher and the young boy, right? The, the, the young boy is going to be instructed by the teacher, and the teacher is going to learn more about the good in light of the beauty of the boy, and the boy is going to learn more about the good in light of what his teacher says. And so, so what I'm emphasizing here is Christianity is starting to move, is going to move in the 12th century towards a concept of love between the equal which we're not going to find in pagan traditions. We're going to find some, some of it in Cicero, his concept of friendship, but still, because Cicero takes Plato <coughs> and talks about 
choice of friendship, and this will have an influence, but, but it's not a common concept of love in the ancient world or even in the medieval world. Now let's get to the 12th century, right? The 12th century is a unique time. If you have, most of the images that you have of the Middle Ages probably come from the 12th century. The 12th century is when we start to have medieval romance. We have King Arthur. We have uh, we have all of knights going on quests. We have uh, wandering minstrels telling tales of love and conquering and defeating dragons. And what's interesting about most of these medieval romances, if you were or court that we call them court and love romances, is that if you were to read them today, you'd probably be a little bit disappointed. Right? Because our concept of what a romance is and their concept of what a romance is don't quite match up. And part of it is this notion of hierarchy. Because you, you will have whole tales where a knight and this lovely young woman go on a quest, help one another, and once they finish that quest, <laughs> guess who marries the knight? Not the woman who's gone on a quest with the knight, but the woman's older sister who's been in a tower somewhere and is high above. Because that's why you go on a quest so you can get the high one. You can get the really like unattainable love. And that's not to say, what's funny is, it, is in, uh, in power relations in, in real life, not kind of imaginary life, often the man had the kind of hierarchical power status with respect to love. But in imaginary life, they, they, they were imagining women as that beauty that makes it causes the soul to sin. But Think about this for a minute. That beauty that causes the soul to ascend is very similar to Plato's notion of the philosopher and the young boy, right? There, there, there's, is this an elevated status of women, or is this a form of the man is the teacher and the woman? Beauty is what's helping him elevate, but is, is actually in an inferior position. But as the 12th century developed, we start to see hints of the kind of romantic love that we talk about today, the kind of love of friendship. And we can, Eric and Need, if you're ever interested, is one of those few medieval romances we have that is about a man and a woman going on a quest together. It's, it's love is about shared experience. Love is about um, friendship. And it's, but it's very unusual. And it's also in the 12th century that we have developing notions of marriage and the sacrament of the church. One reason for this is just purely practical a lot of the time. <coughs> Let's face it, marriage wasn't always done in big ceremonies like we have today. People would say, hey, I'm married to you now. Let's get it on. And then the woman would get pregnant or not get pregnant, and his family would say, well, we actually really wanted you to marry this girl because she's politically more advantageous. And so the woman is now pregnant, but the man is like, well, my family wants me to do this. I was never married to you. Do you see how this works? There's this kind of marriage, because it's not formalized in, in most cases, especially among the lower class, creates a certain kind of vulnerability for women. And so the church is beginning to try to protect women by encouraging church weddings because that they would be in a church but they'd be on church doorsteps because done by a priest because the witnesses protect women and ensure that this is in fact a marriage that everybody recognizes and the church has theological reasons for doing this too because marriage is viewed as a sacrament that is a, an image of the relationship between Christ and his church. And one of the best examples of, of this kind of thinking uh, can be found in the book of St. Victor. And if you look on your handout, I've got a, a quote from him. The, the quote is, is as follows. Now she, Eve, was made from the side of man that it, would, it might be shown that she was created for association and love. Lest perhaps if she had been made from the head she would seem to be preferred to man and to damnation, or from the feet to be subject unto slavery. Since, therefore, she was furnished to man neither as a mistress nor as a handmaid, but as a companion, she had to be produced from his side. 
Furthermore, that the body of woman is said to have been made from the rib of man must be understood thus, that from the substance alone of the rib itself, the same body is believed to have been made by that miracle indeed whereby afterwards five flows of, bro of broad of bread, that was this written, multiplied in the hands of Jesus. Do, do you see the kind of hints of that term constant? Why, why would he want to emphasize identical substance here? That this is some sort of miraculous, it's not just she has some sort of part of Adam's rib, of, of, of Adam's substance, but she is identical substance by that same miracle by which we have the, the loaves and the fishes, where God, where Jesus made enough to feed thousands from seven loaves of bread. What, what, would, what do you think might be going on here?
love letters, right? They're love letters between um, a man and a woman who are, in some sense, they share a love of philosophy, not just a love of, a, a, not just some sort of practical raising of children. By the way, somebody calls this son Yes, <laughs> which is a, a new scientific instrument for, the, for looking at the stars and judging the heights of buildings and everything. It's like calling your son iPod, right? Like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> so he's just like, oh, this is the best thing ever. I would have called him Moon Unit or whatever. Okay, so um, it's, so Eloise writes to Adelard because they want to get her her beginning letters to her, you need it to, to Abelard, you need right to each other. So innocent the pleasure is not by us. Let us not leave your negligence the only happiness that is left to you. And so so she she moves on and you can you read some more of this uh, on your own, but she says, having lost the substantial pleasure of seeing and possessing you, I shall in some measure compensate this loss by the satisfaction I shall find in your writing. There I shall read the most sacred thoughts. I cannot live if you will not tell me that you still love me. And and so these, in some senses, with Abelard and Eloise, we have this kind of example of friendship, marriage, that's, that's step or almost marriage, and you know, outfit. They, they talk sometimes like they're married anyway, and then sometimes they talk like they're not. But like, it's, it's, it's definitely moving in this direction of practical sense, but as you can tell, it's not common. Their love is not a common story. Most people, especially people who had a certain power and position, had to realize that family had certain political responsibilities, certain social responsibilities. And even within the Peter Avalard Eloise dynamic, there is still, she's his student, he's his, he's the teacher. There's still this kind of teacher-student relationship, but what I—I I mean, I told you that story because it's fun, but it does relate, right? Like, it, and, and and you should read more Peter Avalar. Okay, so so now we're ready to hear Richard. Now we've got this foundation to think about. Richard's growing up in this kind of environment. He's in Paris, in a monastery that has made its name by being this kind of in-between place. It's called it. It's, a, it's for Augustine and Canada. And the idea is, is as people are going off to university, there was a concern that people living outside of the community were going to fall into sin, like Peter Abelard. Because they were living in poor houses because they were cheaper. And they were and they were had no community to watch over them. And so the the canons of St. Victor created this this place where you can live in community and actually and study in the intellectual environment of Paris. And these people, they were trying to find a good compromise between the fast learning of the university world and the slow meditative learning of the monks. And so there, it's, it's interesting, they view themselves as both a community designed to minister to those who are there, and at a certain point, a community designed to be priests and ministers to those who are studying at what is to the University of Paris. And Richard is one of the last of, of the great lights in, at this Abbey of St. Victor. And Richard starts to write the Nature Natale. And you'll notice right away that unlike Anselm, Richard is going back to that traditional title, right? You know, Augustine had his day trinitate, Boethius had his day trinitate, and then Anselm talks about the Mongolian and Prosopian, but it's all because of the day trinitate, he says, and then Richard writes his own day trinitate. And it's very much modeled after Anselm's Prosopian. Why do I say it's modeled after the Prosopian, even more than the Mongolian? It's because it's about faith seeking and understanding. It's about trying to come to terms with rationally what we find in scripture. It's not about trying to prove or reason to someone who is outside of faith. So there, that might happen in the course of this, this discussion. It's about taking temporal things 
and trying to rise to the level of eternal things through faith and through reason, using them together. And so, whereas Anselm Mokion is going to take a lot of time to think about how the various being, um, about how God is high in nature is going to be a being nature circle, as I called it, and he's going to think about what it means for God to be the highest nature. Richard's going to start thinking about, well, how do we apply various attributes to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? How do we understand justice to, or the word or wisdom to apply uniquely to the individual persons of the Trinity? So this is one of the reasons why De Trinitate is is interesting because he's he's extending some of these arguments about how nature works and how nature might be manifested in individual members, and that's we're not going to have time to go into that. But he has his most famous argument within De Trinitate is the argument for God being um, necessarily a Trinity. Necessarily a trinity because love is one of the highest goods. So if you look on your handout, you will see Richard writes, it is, Richard begins by a meditation on what it is to be love. He says, it is necessary that love extends to another in order for it to be charity. And remember, charity is not the beginning of goes to the poor in this instance. Charity is the kind of love that is the most selfless, the most pure. Why is he, no, it, it, he why is he, why would it be important to make this point? It would be important to make this point because we can't think of God's love being, it's hard to think of God's love as being a substantial attribute, right? Because it has to extend to another to be a substantial attribute. And as we talk, and what's the problem with thinking about love as, well, if God is the highest love, it's just it just means he created creatures. So he can extend that love to his creatures. What's the problem with this argument? Oh, maybe I'll, I'll rephrase the question a certain way. You might argue that if God is the highest love, and love is one of the, the most important things in the world, that, well, that's why God created the world, so that we have something to love. Is there a problem with this argument? Yes. If he is love, then why, why would he create the world to love? Yeah, I mean, there's a certain kind of concern. We're supposed to be contingent, but that sounds like we're somewhat necessary to him in some way. Good. Good. This makes God dependent on his creation in some way. It makes, we're supposed to be contingent and God's supposed to be able to love us um, out of the bounty of his love, not because he's, not because he needs us in some way. And, and he makes this argument that, and then he goes, that, that perfect happiness what, what is perfect happiness? Perfect happiness requires a certain kind of love. But other, more, so he, he moves his discussion for thinking about love to thinking about what might be the nature of an eternal God and what might be the nature of a perfect, a perfect. If, as Boethius says, God is perfect happiness, what are the requirements for happiness? And then he's going to build upon these arguments for what it means for God to be eternal and what it means for God and God to be perfectly happy. And he's going to add the aspect of, of love there. He's going to say, it is necessary, therefore, that an eternal person have a co-eternal person. Neither could one be superior to the other, nor could one be inferior to the other. This is a technical term, co-eternality. A lot of times when people think about the Trinity and Orthodox models for the Trinity, we often think it's sufficient to say, how, does this, how is the Son eternal? The Son is eternal because he's eternally begotten from the Father. But that's not sufficient for equality because you can have another substance that's eternally begotten from the first substance, and, that, and those substances would still be an, an eternal 
hierarchical relationship. That is not, and we don't want a hierarchy between the father and the son. We want equality. Therefore, we must have co-eternality. What is co-eternality? It means that they share the same eternal substance. They share the same substance that is from itself. It's that and not from another. This is why their substance must be identical. It's the, it's the foundation for their co equality. See where I'm coming, going, moving back to the whole Q of St. Victor thing? Consubstantiality is the basis for co equality. And moreover, the technical <coughs> term for this is going to be co eternality. Co eternality is going to be that that state of sharing equal eternity, which means having being having a substance that is from itself and not from another, in some fundamental way. <coughs> but then he moves on and starts thinking about what is perfect happiness. And perfect happiness, he says, oh, it said, Perfect happiness could not be without true unchangeableness. Neither could there be true unchangeableness without eternity. Why could perfect happiness be without true unchangeableness? The wise happiness to change. Yeah. I mean, you don't want, I mean, if, if, if the foundation of your, your thing is God is perfectly happy, is perfect happiness, you don't want that. Any change would require, would require because it's a perfect, something less, right? It's like saying change is good and everything changes. That's the change is going to change. Yeah. I mean, we, we live in a world of, of fortune, right? It goes up and it goes down. And by definition, that means that it's not always going to be happy. That's kind of our life. But the, the concept of God being perfectly happy requires us to be perfectly unchangeable. And then he, he says, True charity requires a plurality of persons, and true unchangeableness, a co-eternality, a co-eternity of persons. So, so you see how he's bringing the, the, the argument back? Charity needs to extend to another. There has to be some form of plurality here, and there has to be plurality of persons so that it can be shared in some way. And then true unchangeableness requires a co-eternity of persons because Otherwise, these people wouldn't, if these persons would not have, would have happiness that is lost at certain points. It is clear, therefore, that in this trinity, all persons are co-equal just as they are co-eternal. For if they were not existing co-eternally, they would not, they would not, in fact, be co-equals. <coughs> Notice here, I mean, he talks, and, in this, in this portion of the, of the text. By the way, one of the reasons I ha I'm having you read a handout rather than having you read the text is it's not translated yet. It's the process of being translated, it's not fully translated. So I'm giving you as much snippets as I can given the fact that I can't give you a whole text. But this idea is that, but the idea is that true love, true charity, needs to be a relationship between persons who are eternally related, but also are co-equally related. You see where we're where seeing, where we're getting to see this in, innovation? It's not to say, it's, it's not innovative to think that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal. What it is kind of innovative to begin to think about love as a, a state when it's most perfectly instantiated where you have equals in love with one another. That's what's, what's, what's new going on here. And these, these equals are equal on the basis of their shared substance. And so he, he compares then, and he brings, Richard brings back the argument to think about how this, this form of love in God has a certain 
parallelism with a difference when we're talking about divine and, and human love. So if you, if you look on the last bit of your handout, we'll, we'll, we'll review view this argument for why God needs to be uh, <coughs> perfect love, and then and then we'll see how, we'll try to think through what it is that makes this a parallel mystery. The mystery of divine love and the mystery of, of human love. So the first kind of set of premises is that perfect happiness requires true unchangeableness. And true unchangeableness requires eternity. Therefore, perfect happiness requires eternity and true unchangeableness. So this is kind of a foundation for, for what it means. You see how Richard's starting rather from the concept of highest good to argue for other divine attributes. He's starting from perfect happiness, highest happiness to argue for other divine attributes. And perfect happiness requires true charity. True charity re requires a plurality of co-equal persons. Therefore, perfect happiness requires a plurality of co-equal persons. And then finally, kind of bringing all of these things together, we have uh, we have uh, the last sil uh, syllogism. It's not exactly these are exactly syllogisms, but perfect happiness, which is understood as True unchangeableness of charity requires eternal eternal charity. Eternal charity requires co-eternal persons. Therefore, perfect happiness, which would be true unchangeableness and true charity, requires a plurality of co-eternal, co-equal persons. When we start thinking about how we would apply this concept of divine nature to human nature, are there any questions about how this argument is working? Okay. How do we get three? I see how we get a plurality. But why specifically three? <laughs> yeah, that is um, one of the things I'm trying to work out because what he basically argues is that it's somehow self evident that three in love is better than two in love. And honestly, it sounds like a menage a trois. Like, it is, <laughs> I, I don't think that's what he's going for. Um, I do think. Though he he must he, the only thing that makes sense of it is that he's going back to this standard analogy from Augustine that picks, is picked up by Anselm of love is lover beloved and love and a perfect love somehow the love that binds the first two is so perfect it's a person in and of itself. I mean, that's that's the best I can make of it, but it is one of those areas where I'm just like, Richard, what more information? <laughs> so, but that's a good question. Well, <clears throat> I have another question, <clears throat> closely related, which is, is the love bidirectional or unidirectional? That is to say, is it father loving son and the love is the Holy Spirit? Or does the love go both ways? And the reason I ask is, First of all, there's this dispute between East and West about whether the Spirit proceeds from the Father alone or from the Father and the Son. If it's mutual, he's got a nice argument that, look, it must proceed from both because it's a mutual love relationship. But if it's just in one direction, it would just be the love of the lover, right? And so then the Eastern position, that actually it proceeds from the Father, is the right answer. So it seems to me actually crucial whether this is a sort of love that flows in both directions as you might think a perfect love would be, right? It would be mutual. Or whether it really is just lover, loved, the love, where it feels like, yeah, that could go in one direction without going in the other. That's fascinating. Go ahead. I mean, doesn't um, Augustine and Anselm both say that the Holy Spirit is limited to both the Father's love and the Son's love? It's just that the Son's love somehow derives from the Father's. And so, so the Father's is somehow prior. Um, in a way that respects sort of the, the order of that's among all the members of the Trinity. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Anselm has this image of the father looking at himself in a mirror, and the son is the image reflected in the mirror, and the smile on the father's face as he beholds himself as the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and notice the smile will be there both in the image and in the person. <laughs> But you're right, in, a, in the image in a derivative sense. So it's a nice follow for what you've just said. Okay. As you say, I think if the love does not go both mm -hmm. directions, you end up with much bigger problems than if it does. I mean, just for the sake of ease, you know, of an argument, if the sun is not 
said to be also loving the Father, but the Holy Spirit is still representing love in itself as a person. And you've got more problems because then you have to get into, okay, well, how is the Son you know, co-equal to the Father? How are they the same person of the Trinity, but yet he doesn't share the same character, you know, a characteristic as love? So if, G, you know, if, if the Son is fully God just as much as the Father is, how does he not share that same love relationship as the Father? It almost seem like you're making him inferior if he doesn't share that same that yeah, that, that is very helpful. Thank you guys, because as you can tell, I'm working on this. I'm writing on this. So this is this is exactly the sort of feedback I, I'm interested in, because I think Dan's point is correct, that if we don't have this concept of love going both ways, we might run into certain, certain problems. I mean, you, you're you running into certain problems with code equality, but you might, if the love is going both ways, have a way of reconciling east and west. Fascinating, but Dude, Augustine and Anselm or Richard um, comment on um, the spirit loving father, the Holy Spirit loving the Son, um, and how the God love is supposed to be and, um, on the same level as uh, in a way that preserves code each and every and quality um, with the Father's love and the Son's love. I mean, because when given simplicity, you might think that. Follow from that, that the Holy Spirit serves sort of its own its own love. Yeah. They, they don't want to be that way. Yeah, that's that's also a, a really good question. Does does the Holy Spirit love in some way? Would that make him not? Would that make him inferior? That I mean, what I need to do now, I guess, based upon your arguments, is to go back and see. First of all, though he's getting initially this analogy of love from lover, beloved, and love. I'm not sure he uses that language as much. He seems to be, and that's something to look for when I go back to the Greek text, I think, is whether Richard actually uses the language of love or love or love. Go ahead. I was just going to say, thinking about it, I mean, to me, the more substantial claim is that love in itself is a person. So, like, in just a normal relationship, like myself and my wife, like, I love her, and love is what binds us together, in the same that God and the Son, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit is what binds us together. So to me, it would seem almost odd to say, I love love, and my wife is what binds myself and love together. That just almost seems like it doesn't make any sense to go with that. But I, I, I see you're worried that the Holy Spirit has to somehow maybe be more involved in the love relationship than just what binds the Father and the Son together, because then that would almost make it seem excluded from that relationship. Yeah, and, and actually, the, the way you're talking now makes me realize, because I've often thought that one might say that the love that binds the, the, the man and his wife becomes embodied in a child. I mean, and a word children might think of it. As, and so it's, and of course, the relationship between divine love and human love are going to be not quite, um, identical in this, this respect, but you might see the third being the child that comes from the love. Because that would be a personified love, as it were. But the last, uh, but, and so it makes me think we ought to read this last quote that I have for you from Richard, where he says, from these, it's actually the next to the last one on your handout, from these considerations, therefore, we can gather that there is no true simplicity where there is no true simplicity, there cannot be true equality. In this trinity, therefore, nothing is dissimilar to another. Neither is there inequality in one thing to another. Truly, where true eternity is, there cannot be before or after. So also where there is... Oh, well. The battery went dead. <laughs> Does anyone have that anymore? Okay, would you mind reading it out, uh, out loud for us? Um, from where I stopped. Oh, just uh, the, the part about <coughs> where did I stop? I don't know. We can start from the beginning. It's so short. From these considerations, therefore, we can gather that where there is no true simplicity, there cannot be true equality. In this trinity, moreover, nothing is dissimilar to another. Neither is there inequality in one thing to any other. Truly, where true eternity is, there cannot be before or after. So also, where there is true and changeful immensity, there cannot be more or less. In those, therefore, in which there is the same nature of eternity and immensity, there cannot be, there cannot be not even the slightest alteration or vicissitude of inequality. 
Nothing there is before him, nothing after, nothing greater or lesser, but all three persons are co-eternal and co-equal to the others. Okay. Did you see a clearer part of that? Close to one just above. Yeah, number 10. Oh, the mirror is number 10. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> that was a good summary. So, would you mind moving to the share? Behold how human and divine nature regard themselves reciprocally and somewhat in opposition and respond one to the other as if through a mirror, as created nature and uncreated nature, and as temporal and eternal. Okay, good. Come on. So, so he's Richard and and as we're concluding, begins to begins to think that human nature and divine nature, this this love, perfect love relationship that you can imagine in God, that's a, an eternal relationship between co-equal, co-eternal persons, um, that that is perfect happiness, can be found somewhat in the relationship between husband and wife. And what's interesting. Okay, so uh, <laughs> one of the things that, and, and so he, he finds that well, here's, here's where the parallel mystery resides. It is just as mysterious for us to think of how one substance can be related as, a, as three persons as it is to imagine that two persons can be come one. By means of marriage, it's it's this kind, and so, and, and this is a, a form of thinking that that we haven't encountered yet. But it's basically the idea that we have things on this earth that have nothing to do with God that are pretty profoundly mysterious, and one of the greatest mysteries is how a man and a woman can by means of marriage become one. How two persons can, in some sense, become one flesh, one substance. They're made from co-eternal substances, they become one substance. And so, what? And, and in the beginning of children, they have children that share their substance. So so what he does is he, he sees it, he, he describes it as a mirror because in mirror, things are slightly reversed, right? So, like, I might talk to myself. If, if I saw myself in a mirror, I wouldn't be holding it in my right hand. I'd be holding it in my left hand, right? So, so in, in, with, on one side of the mirror, you've got three persons, one substance, and that's pretty mysterious. But on another side of the mirror, you have two or three substances, depending on how you look at it, and three, two or three persons, depending on how you look at it, and one substance. That's pretty freaky. And there's there's the co-eternity, co it's it's not going to be an exact image. The temporal image is going to have imperfections, it's going to have the beginning of love, the end of love, there are going to be hierarchies within this love, um, particularly parent-child hierarchies. But what you can see is that th this is a movement in Trinitarian theology that is going to have a, a radical effect eventually upon how people think about marriage in general. And it was already moving in that direction, but when you start thinking about what would be the highest love and the highest love would be between equals, it's going to change the way you think about marriage and relationships and move you from a world in which men have the most physical power and the most monetary power to a world in which, regardless of power differential, if you watch Marriage is about, should be about love. So, are there any comments or questions? Well, I hope you're just